A big part of this whole process is encouraging, I mean, these types of conversations and encouraging us to, I mean, us, I say, but particularly for the residents of Norman uh, to be able to engage in conversations at times with new conversation partners. I think that's one of the things that I was excited by, uh, not only this morning, but also last night, was seeing some people meeting each other for the first time. And for some of the folks in the community, you attend council meetings every so often, or you participate in different uh, engagement sessions, and you end up seeing many of the same faces, and that's wonderful. But to broaden the conversation, as well as to add new layers to it. My name is Norm, and I am uh, employed by Strong Towns. Uh, today's actually the one year anniversary of my time at Strong Towns, and I hail from Vancouver, British Columbia. Yes, thank you. <laughs> And um, before this, I was actually a pastor for 10 years, uh, serving churches in Ontario and then in Vancouver, British Columbia. And I came across Strong Towns by starting to think about the way in which our communities felt disconnected in many ways or often struggling uh, to really feel that deep sense of togetherness and community that it seemed, talking with our ancestors, that they had enjoyed previous to this. Um, in particular, in our community in, in Vineland, Ontario, there were some very significant roads that ran right through the core of the community and as a consequence, made it really not a good idea to walk those streets. You felt unsafe by the, the fact that you were a few inches away from big trucks trundling on down the road, uh, coming down a hill and, and sort of descending right into the heart of the community. There was the concern, there was the sense, we've built our environment in a way that is profoundly shaping us. And as a pastor, I was seeing what those consequences were. Pastors, if you have attended a church or a synagogue, your rabbi or your, your priest, uh, they will be telling you, you need to love your neighbor. And it's in the Bible, so there's good you know, reason to say it. But along the way, the challenge was, is there something in the way that we are building our society that is actually making it more challenging for people to relate to each other, to know each other, uh, to share in one another's lives? And so I came across Strong Towns because I was looking into kind of the question of how do we shape our communities in a way that benefits everyone rather than just continuing to trundle all along in the way that we've been doing it. And what was fascinating to me and what will really feature in the discussion this afternoon, what we will be ta chiefly taking up is the question of economic performance, which sounds like all of the light has just left the room and now we're stuck just talking numbers. But what was striking to me is that as I learned about the Strong Towns approach and efforts to reestablish healthy, prospering communities, that there was a core economic argument being advanced that it is not in our best interest to work these types of systems in this type of way from a financial perspective, as well as a social perspective, a health perspective, or a religious perspective for those that are, are religiously inclined, as well as just the, the core sense that something is breaking and we have ways to reestablish our communities. And so just to introduce you briefly to Strong Towns, uh, it is a member-supported nonprofit that is seeking to change or, and really, we can say also, we are changing the development pattern in North America. Uh, we have over uh, several million people each year are reading Strong Towns content, engaging with us, and helping the Strong Towns organization as a nonprofit, together with its larger collection of writers and participants in what we're doing, uh, to be able to influence conversations like this, conversations at city halls, conversations in, in, in street corner pubs and coffee shops and, and any number of other places. Uh, we're seeing a, a great deal of interest in younger generations saying, I'm studying planning or I'm an engineer in training and I'm struggling because the, the dominant forms of the profession don't seem to line up with what it takes to allow people to flourish in places where they live. And so as a consequence, Strong Towns is working uh, to chiefly advocate uh, for, I would say, better solutions or stronger uh, ways of building communities. And, and what we want to really focus on is how do we set in motion a process that strengthens and builds great places? Uh, if you think of those old time tractors and they would have a giant flywheel on them and, they, and, and in order to get them going, you would have to first get that first round going. And then the next round would go a little easier and the next one would go a little easier and pretty soon the motor was spinning but it didn't have to work that hard because the big flywheel was carrying all of this mass allowing for the development of 
whatever you needed it to do. And so we want to reestablish that flywheel. We are convinced that we have basically ground to a halt many of the great city building and town making practices uh, that defined thousands of years of prior civilization. That if you go back, as Chuck talked about last night, and look at the types of neighborhoods and cities that emerged, uh, they would be much the same across all sorts of different cultures. Much like bee bees have beehives and ants have anthills, uh, that human cities up until the post-World War II era largely resembled each other. Strong cores developing ex uh, rings around it allowing for, uh, in time, the establishment of new cities and new towns at some distance, but, but not so distant and not so far apart that it would simply sprawl from one to the next. You would have defined perimeters and careful, careful conservation of resources in these places. And so from this, what we actually have sought to lay out, again, last, this came up last night, uh, but is a process of revitalizing communities in part by investing very, very carefully uh, to humbly observe where people in the community are struggling, uh, to take note of their needs, and then to ask the question, what is that next smallest thing uh, that we can do right now to address that struggle? I'll touch on a word that will come up in a quote just in the next page, but we need to be able to iterate. To be able to iterate means to do lots of little things, to be able to test little things. If you've ever developed a, a craft, you know that that's what you need to do. Uh, I have a friend that's trying to learn how to spin wool. She's figuring it out. She's discovering new techniques, new methods, watching all sorts of YouTube content, uh, taking that approach and doing so as an individual. And one of the great tragedies of our time is that people feel disempowered to do this in their communities. They live in oftentimes in residential neighborhoods that have been designed according to a standard and are expected to remain as they are in perpetuity. The sales brochure says, move in, and nothing will change. But life's not like that. Nothing is able to simply not change. And so one of the strategies that we have in the community where I live in Delta, BC, when we try to connect with a lot of folks, I would say our neighborhoods are changing. And the question we have, especially as housing prices keep going up and up and up, is do we want our neighborhoods to simply become more exclusive and expensive? Or are we willing to modify them and do so in a way that allows them to become more inclusive and diverse? To allow our communities to mature, much like as Chuck talked about last night, as we expect a toddler to become in time an adolescent. And instead, the North American pattern of development has caused a lot of neighborhoods to be frozen in amber. And then for the fierce fights to be over the fact that one single family home is being replaced by another single family home that dwarfs that particular home. And yet there's no additional area for people to move in. There's no additional housing or, or homes for people to dwell in. There's no additional ways to add in new shops, new ventures, new opportunities for people to live with their parents or different types of things like this. And so what we are urging communities across North America to do is to find those small things and do them. Uh, in my case, I did this with a shovel. Uh, now, this is a small example, but it is an example of what we need to do. Just a few blocks or a few um, houses down from where we lived in a townhouse in Richmond, BC, uh, there was one of those little pocket parks that the developer was obliged to provide and put about as much thought into the development of that little park as you might expect. It was pea gravel, a sort of wooden structure, and that was basically it. And so my son was two. And I brought him with me to the park over and over again, and we would play in the grass, and, and he would sometimes climb on the play structure, but got kind of tired of it. So I took my big utility shovel and just piled all of the pea gravel into a big pile. He was filthy, but having fun. And for weeks afterwards, I saw children using that space, adapting it for their own uses. Suddenly it was a racetrack. It was, it, they were pouring water down in and seeing the way that it went. And, and the consequence was it was taking some small, maybe unauthorized action in a public space to make it our own, to adapt it to our needs. And the truth is that citizens have the capacity in all of our communities uh, to do this. But we often fall into a pattern where we say we need to wait for approval, we need to wait uh, for some committee to agree to it. We need to wait for funding. Uh, we need to wait before we do anything so that way we don't ever put a foot wrong. And the Strong Towns approach says, put a lot of little feet wrong, but also some of them are gonna, get, gonna work out. 
Uh, do those things. Do it right now and then repeat it. And so as Chuck Marone talks about, it is critical that the responses considered are the next smallest thing that can be done. Uh, there's no need for years of study or deliberation. Instead, little bets uh, can be quickly undone if they don't achieve the desired results or if they have unintended negative consequences. We might learn a thing or two as we continue in this process, as we allow our neighborhoods uh, to iterate. And so the message this afternoon, uh, in about 30 minutes or so, is that our current path, meant as a means of securing prosperity for all, has unwittingly trapped us in a system that is incapable of building lasting prosperity. And what I want to offer to you as, as a North Star or something to take away from this, is that the traditional development pattern uh, that Chuck has been talking about, uh, describing the ways in which cities would mature, would thicken, would allow the next increment of homes to emerge within a community, would allow people to do with their property uh, the things that they desire to, so long as it didn't have a massive negative impact on them, that that is a path that offers us a a way forward uh, to relieve us from the trouble that we've gotten ourselves into. And truly, it will address things like children having to move away from here because they can't find either an opportunity for themselves or a home for themselves. It allows us to address the situations where people are saying, I have a modest income and can afford a very modest type of rent, but there's nothing available for me. And so I'm descending unwillingly into a pattern of homelessness, struggling, needing to uh, receive more support from a community. And yet the community struggling to provide that support because it's not happening at the most local and most intimate of levels, at the neighbor to neighbor level, at at all of the different tools that used to be commonplace, uh, boarding houses and other types of things that that were permitted and and developed a bad rap in some circles and were, were pushed away and yet we pushed away far more than we thought we were uh, when these decisions were being made. And so uh, the bad news, what have we done? We have traded a robust incremental approach uh, for a complicated and fragile pattern of suburban style development. Uh, And for those that are watching, definitely pair this uh, together with the talk that Chuck gave last night or the regular Strong Towns curbside chat. But I want to touch on uh, the way in which we see this, uh, again, uh, a bit of a history lesson here. And I'll I'll show you what it looks like with your Main Street. Uh, The traditional development pattern Again, conserving scarce resources and using them ever so carefully, making small bets, meant that frequently what you would see, and this would be the story of Norman and other places along the rail lines in particular, uh, you would get as a private uh, wealthy landowner, so the, the rail companies or others, they would say, hey, we're building the train station or building and establishing the train stop with a yard to transfer goods and a, a station to collect people. Then as you would do that, you would also lay out the town identify where you would intend for significant landmarks to be built, but the key is you would wait to build them. You wouldn't build the Grand Central Park the first day that you got into town or the second day after you opened your train stop. That would all wait. And private investment, the black line, would be the leader that would then result in consequent public investments. Ever so careful, always ensuring that if at any point this began to go down, if private investment began to taper off, that you would see no new spending, that you would see a a realization, we need to hold the horses, get this figured out, see a return of investment, and then continue on our merry way, building great structures. And critically, our ancestors built amazing structures, established wonderful services within communities, some of it was publicly provided, others of it was provided through nonprofit groups, what we would call today nonprofit groups, uh, civil society groups, all of these types of things. But along the way, there were built in feedback loops to say, This bar you shall come and no further uh, when it came to public spending. And so, this is what this would look like in our downtown area. Notice these are very modest structures, it's only two stories, and this structure is, is set, brought right up to the street making not only, importantly, full use of the land available, but actually tying it directly to the street, which is the lifeblood for these businesses. The street where people walk, where people transact, what you can see is this structure in particular uh, has, a, has a small acreage. Uh, it, I think it was 0.111 acres. And so what Strong Towns has been doing, uh, guided by the work that Urban 3 was doing and things like that, are, are organizations like that, 
uh, what we've begun doing is, is using a very simple metric, which is the value per acre. And I'll touch on why this matters. Uh, think of a big truck, a Ford F-150, and think of a, a small little Kia. Which of the two will be able to drive further? Well, probably the Ford truck, because it's got a big tank. But if we evaluate how much bang for our buck are we getting, all of a sudden you realize that that more efficient vehicle is actually able to get you much further ahead. And so in a sense, your net outlay per mile is gonna be considerably less than it is to drive a large truck unless you need that truck for added towing capacity or simply to appeal to uh, your inner core desire to have an amazing truck and, and all power to you. But the question is, when it comes to the public purse, when it comes to building strong communities, what do we do when we turn away from projects that have a high value per acre and begin to descend to see a very different pattern emerge. So take $4.8 million an acre. Now the actual property is only worth 593, but if we take it by, extrapolate it to what it would be worth if it occupied a full acre, uh, this is the value that it has. And critically, this becomes the capacity that you have to be able to pay for things. Not right away, not with every single dime in the 593,000, but if I compare my piggy bank with my son's, the fact that I have a larger piggy bank or a piggy bank with more in it allows me uh, to withdraw every so often for regular needs that I have in ways that he simply can. He's eight. And so he thinks that whenever he spends his $15, uh, that it just magically regenerates itself. And I said, no, you have to work for that. You have to put the time and investment into it uh, to cause that to grow. And so in the traditional development pattern, we understood that we need these types of careful investments that use property well in order to generate value within a community. Here's another structure. Uh, again, a significantly um, more valuable structure, a slightly larger footprint, but that doesn't matter because we're equalizing by the, uh, the value per acre. Uh, what does it have? Two stories. It has a slightly more intense land use. And the value is there uh, of $1.24 million an acre. Uh, the, or, I mean, uh, $7.8 million an acre. Uh, here's another structure, just uh, uh, up the street from the city hall. Again, very modest structures, uh, but high performing. And if this structure was given the permission or the landowner was able to add a third story on the back half, you know that that would increase. Or if there was a, a greater capacity to do something in the basement, uh, that, that that value would increase. And, and it would be fairly modest improvements that would cause this capacity to build wealth and store wealth as a reservoir within the community. I think a lot of these buildings on your downtown streets are your piggy banks. And they're all well stocked. Even if the businesses within them are not cash flowing very well. Even if some of them are staying vacant for seasons at a time, yet they are holding their value and have been since the early 1920s or 1910s when they were constructed. And so here is the difference. In the suburban experiment, what we do is we say, okay, let's first do everything we need. Let's build out all of the infrastructure in order to get to this point. Remember, very different than the traditional development pattern. You might slowly pave a street only after you had proved that there was sufficient capital available to be able to make that a sustainable, viable investment. But instead, what we have is we build the highway interchange, we run the utilities to the site, uh, the cities buck up the money to make this happen, or they borrow it, or, or they basically work out some sort of a deal with a TIF in order to make this happen. And the consequence is you begin to get these types of things. But I want to show you what that looks like. This is a parcel not far, it's still on Main Street, uh, but built in a suburban style. Uh, built in a style that does not make great use of land, in a style that is, is accommodated to the needs of those that are arriving by automobile, but actually overcompensating for those expected needs. Uh, we, we publish maps all the time of Black Friday parking lots, where on Black Friday, which would be the busiest day in the season, there's still acres and acres of ample parking in so many of these places. Almost never would you see uh, this structure having all of its spaces that are currently occupied by tarmac being occupied uh, by vehicles. And so we have a sudden decline in the value that is, is held within this area. Uh, what about here? This is almost brand new. Uh, but this structure comes in at, at $1.4 million an acre. Notice the actual market value is significantly higher $22 million, you say, Norm, you're crazy. 
You were just showing us $593,000 parcels. Do the math. That is clearly way more money. But when you multiply or divide it by the amount of acreage that this site, this whole complex consumes, all of a sudden what keeps happening is your efficiency, your capacity drops, drops, drops. And Norman's full of this. Uh, $1.3 million an acre at uh, uh, 1424th Avenue. And here, notice also uh, one of the challenges that we have is that as a consequence of the way in which assessments work, many of these are assessed at one value, but then actually taxed at a lower rate. In the quest to bring in this type of development, which would only be capable of producing, in the sense that having the capacity to store up wealth at $1.3 million an acre, The deal is made that we will simply allow you to come into town, allow you to build out this multi-acre site, and we won't tax you as much as we otherwise would. This is commonplace in the state. This is commonplace in Norman. It's it's unsurprisingly also commonplace in many other areas. The challenge is, is now the efficiency has dropped even lower. If we take this new taxable value, we see uh, that it it is a fraction of what we see in the downtown. I, again, another site, $1.3 million an acre on a, on a $14 million site, but again, it's knocked down uh, to 928000 an acre. Uh, we have another one, an interstate. Uh, again, $20 million, but it's knocked down to thir- $13 million, and the consequence is that it comes in at $574,000 an acre. This means that these sites are like my son's piggy bank. The only trouble is they're consuming a lot of land, requiring a lot of public infrastructure. Think of all the pipes surface, or providing surface drainage, as well as water, as well as sewage. I think of, in a sense, the distance that a police officer, if they were on foot, they would have to walk a long ways to respond to a call here, compared to being able to walk up and down the main street and help and assist many, many buildings, or uh, many, many people. And so I want to compare, uh, for example, this last one that I just showed you. That's what 22.8 acres looks like at 584 or 574,000 an acre. Contrast that, and I haven't been able to do the numbers uh, this morning, uh, but 23 acres on Main Street. And remember, each of those structures is coming in anywhere between $2.5 million an acre to eight, nine. Some of the better ones that we didn't even pick are upwards of 10 or $11 million an acre. You have a massive reservoir of wealth. And yet, when people look at the city of Norman, when people tell the story of the city, their assumption is that the right is the money pit and the left is how we get our money. The right is the money pit, the left is the money pot, and our contention and the math shows that it is the exact opposite. It also means that these core initiatives to invest in your downtown areas are some of the best performing investments that you can be making. And so we ask the question, how can we improve a $22 million property to be worth a comparable $123.63 million? How do you improve uh, the parcel on the left? It would be a massive undertaking. It would be a shift in our perceptions. And yet we have downtown core areas that are vastly outperforming the brand new stuff. Most of the time, this power center on the left is going to go through the natural process that I saw in Buffalo, New York, saw in many other places, which is that they build it, they come, they stay a while, and then they go. Whereas your downtown area, if one person goes, another person comes in. In many, uh, several of the sites that I showed you, they're, they're struggling to get enough tenants, and yet they still have the, the ability to pay the bills to be able to provide not only property tax, but also sales tax, and to assist the community in so many other ways. On the right, uh, you have dozens, if not hundreds, of owners. On the left, you have one or two or a well-financed uh, sh- a shareholding corporation. And the challenge is, is that we're leaving all this value on the table. And so we ask the question, how do we, come, how do we become vibrant again? Or when you think of Oklahoma University, uh, how do you find ways in order to allow new people to get a start at starting a business? Is it going to be by purchasing the thing on the left? Or is it going to be by allowing themselves to get into one of the parcels on the right? Again, this is the use of space. And, And again... Sometimes people will say, well, but see, on the left, they're providing surface parking. They're providing uh, passageways. Uh, They have to provide their own storm sewer, whereas on the right, the city has to do it. 
I say, yeah, but which one of those allows you to have a street festival? Which one of those can be converted into a, a pedestrian zone or converted into some new public use? Uh, which of those is something that the city cash flows positive regularly from and can use in all sorts of diverse ways? People on the left would only be doing so as a PR effort. The folks on the right participate in what they are doing because they know the v downtown has vitality, has strength. And so the great criticism is that, well, the costs are higher on the right for the city. But the answer is there's so much more value being generated and produced in these areas. And so if we had the property tax numbers, we could run the property tax numbers and, and it would show that these right parcels are vastly outperforming the left. And yet everyone assumes we need more of the left and less of the right. We had a proposal uh, last night from someone to say, just tear down Main Street and stick up towers. Yeah. It's not a recommended uh, action from, on the part of strong towns. Um, because you would be undoing the things that have made your community able to withstand, just think, even several generations of being poorly invested in still allowed the parcels on the right to exist, to remain, to endure. It's sort of like farm animals that are maltreated and yet they carry on. And so this is the situation that we find ourselves in and the challenges are huge in terms of what we do Oh, but then what do we do? Oh, what do we do about this? Oh, we touched on this again last night, but allow the next increment by right. Allow housing to emerge within existing neighborhoods. Uh, this actually applies also to commercial uh, structures, retail structures, uh, with a minimum amount of regulatory friction. We say that there should be two lanes within the city of Norman. That one lane is, I want to take my existing property and do just a little bit more with it. And so you walk in by nine o'clock at nine o'clock in the morning with a ninth grade education and by noon you leave with your building permit in hand. The other lane is to go through what we now consider the conventional lane of getting a public hearing, asking for variances. You could potentially ask for way more, a 14 story tower. But let that go through the whole process of the whole rigmarole that the cities have established. But at the same time, allow the other lane, the fast lane and allow that to be the thing that the big builders are not going to take advantage of, but your small craft builders, your person that just graduated from trade school and she says, I want to build my first project, she's going to take the fast lane every time. She's not going to wait to get held up at City Hall, but instead say, I will do the thing that I'm permitted to do by right. Walk in, walk out, begin construction. Within a short amount of time, she has fresh capital in hand to be able to start another project. This is recreating that healthy ecosystem of local construction, local investment, and local opportunity uh, that our city so desperately need. Another core principle that we have uh, introduced last night again is that no neighborhood should be subject to radical change, but simultaneously, no neighborhood uh, should be exempt from change. And it's because the tr this is part of what the traditional development pattern teaches us. Again, we can study cities of past decades, past generations, past millennia, and see this. The traditional development pattern of allowing the next increment to merge within communities as they desire to invest in their place provides this path to freedom. And so what, if, what do we do? We identify ingredients of genuine, durable, lasting value and we focus improvements in these areas. And critically, as we think of downtowns and other places, we also stop harming them. Uh, my brother-in-law wrote a great article talking about his neighborhood that is a neighborhood full of illegals. And they're not illegal immigrants, they're illegal buildings. Buildings that cannot be constructed under the current zoning bylaws, under the current practices of divvying up specific areas for single-family homes, multi-family apartments, uh, for the ability for someone to have a backyard suite, other things like that. And yet he said, my neighborhood is amazing. It allows for people to grow up there, to be baptized, married, and die there, uh, to have the whole gamut of, of human life in that place. And we've ruled that out, and so we need to bring that back. Uh, because we can truly restore the capacity uh, to create and sustain local prosperity. Um, I was going to tell you about Tim, uh, a, a great guy who asked me if Strong Towns was a cult. Uh, I'll leave that as a cliffhanger. It was a great question. Um, but he, as I talked with Tim, he was a builder from Wisconsin. He was touching on all of the things that he's seen in terms of changes in the way that we approach development. He said, we have lost sight of what it takes uh, to build enduring prosperity. And I hope even that the display that I showed you of, of the contrast of low-performing big box centers compared with high-performing downtowns 
And yet all the focus remaining, not on the downtown, but on the big box stores, is what it, we mean when we say that we've lost sight of what it takes. Uh, but what can change first? Here again, I want to introduce uh, our public investment process. Uh, strive to change this. Uh, strive to make this commonplace. Uh, challenge the mayor or challenge members of city council. Challenge uh, the, the planner in your, in your neighborhood. Hey, I'd like to try some small thing. Can we get a group together? Uh, there's an ad hoc committee that the city has established. That would be a great sounding board for these types of ideas. There's a strong town's local conversation emerging uh, to continue the conversation onwards and to press forward uh, with these small things. Again, we need to lower the bar of entry to home ownership. Uh, this is the building block or ladder of prosperity, but we've simply chopped the lower rungs off. Uh, I have this as a renter where I'm like, for me to get to the first rung is to try to get there, but there's no rungs. They've all been cut off. Same thing for small business owners. So many of them face major barriers. And so we touch on this frequently, but we need to lower the bar of entry, not only for homes, but also for small businesses and allow the next increment by right. I guess I touched on before, and, and I want to touch on what that means. Uh, many people seem to fear that if they allow development in their neighborhood, it will change drastically. And so they're very skeptical of what we mean when we talk about by right development. And so we studied it. This is in uh, Minneapolis. When zoning reform occurred and they said, we will allow uh, the redevelopment of accessory dwelling units and you're allowed to build a duplex, uh, the consequence of it was that about one in 48 homes were built every six years. That's actually fairly standard across many, many, many cities, except for the ones that have gone completely nuts. And so the consequence is that if the homes, you can see on, a, on a, any given block, they're shaded dark red. Those are the ones that are being torn and rebuilt uh, over a six year span. And the challenge that we have in our, our city is that the only thing that's happening is we are tearing down single family homes that have lived out their lifespan that served as affordable housing for families. We live in a, in a beat, what's called a BC box. She ain't pretty, but she works as a home for us to live in. But in time, a speculative or an investor or somebody that's just wealthy is gonna buy it, tear it down. And then the question is, what is the easiest thing for them to build? In the midst of a housing crisis, in the midst of a situation where we have way more people needing way more homes than we currently have available, yet the easiest thing to show up at 9 a.m. and leave at noon is to be able to replace it with a $3 million, $4 million, 5,600 square foot home. That's not smart. We should make that at least have to go through a few hurdles and yet a like-for-like -like replacement, although, as anyone who's lived in the neighborhood a long time knows, it's not always like-for-like, -like, it's like-for-luxury, the consequence of that shift while forbidding everything else, that there's no way that a nonprofit could bid on our lot and stick in four townhouses or do something like a, a co-housing space for five families to live in together. We've created this situation where we incentivize the very thing that we need the least of and forbid the things that we need the most of. And so again, a, a plea and an urging uh, within the city of Norman is to embrace accessory dwelling units. Uh, they take many different forms. They're often, I, I like to talk about this as innocuous housing or imperceptible housing, uh, the stuff that you wouldn't otherwise notice that, oh, Bob and Sally have a new family living in their backyard. And yet, truly, these things just fit right within neighborhoods and don't cause the massive disruptions that would occur with a brand new six over one or other thing like that. I also say, end the apartment ban. The question is, how do we not see that these are the types of structures that allow a whole host of different family arrangements uh, to be worked out? If you're a retiree, or if you're a brand new student, or you're looking for a place, you've just gotten divorced and need some place to hold up for a while. These are the types of spaces that our cities were full of, and now they are banned. Banned in all but a few narrow little corridors where they can't compete and build structures like this in comparison with the bigger, taller ones that take up an entire block. These were common, and we've deliberately ruled them out. Uh, there was anti-immigrant uh, prejudice uh, in Vancouver. It was, well, that's where people from China or from Asia are going to live. And so in the 1920s, they said, if we get rid of this, then we get rid of that problem. Well, one, it wasn't the problem, and two, People still found ways to move into our communities, but we continue to remove these types of things and then wonder why seniors feel isolated because they don't have six neighbors to share their life with. While well, families struggle because they say, we could move into something like that that'd be closer to work, closer to schools, uh, closer to the things that we need. And get an encouragement uh, to lower minimum lot sizes. Uh, this is just very simple mathematics. 
And when you lower the minimum lot sizes, you can bring down the core acquisition costs as well as promote the introduction of more housing. Uh, another thing is to allow a residential into uh, quote unquote commercial areas. Uh, our municipalities love the idea of very clean, simple maps. There's one color here, another color here. And we say mix it, match it, move it together. Uh, don't just uh, encourage stacking of uses, but fluid uses. That something can be a dance studio one day and turn into a bachelor su a, a suite the next day. Provided that you meet the building code, provided that the, the place doesn't burn down, uh, go ahead and do those types of things. And this is part of that iterative process of building great communities. Another encouragement is to provide parking discretion. That is that people who are business owners or people that are establishing a home, uh, that they can identify for themselves the, the degree to which they seek to provide on-street, or they're not providing the on-street parking, but to provide uh, on-site parking. Uh, to provide that and, and one of the things that cities can do as well is, is to begin the process of gradually identifying ways uh, to trim back the oversupply of parking in, within the community uh, and it's a good thing to do it. Uh, City of Toronto, which I know is a larger municipality than here, uh, showed 49 times as much money coming into their coffers uh, than the parking that they replaced. Uh, and so one of the challenges that we have, again, this is borrowing from the cul-de-sac uh, institute, is, is the recognition that new development is required to build parking, which then results that space that was meant for people, kind of, remember that apartment I showed you, the six uh, units, three-story walk-up apartment, under parking, with parking requirements that currently exist in the city, you can't build that. And so the result is that it's allocated to cars, which take up only one story, unless you're gonna really invest in a parking deck, and so the consequence is that no matter how much demand or lack of demand there is, it just gets set aside. With, we would uh, strenuously confirm uh, with really dumb numbers when it comes to even setting those parking requirements. But then people are pushed to live an auto-centric life, in part because they have the car, but also because of the way in which it causes communities to spread out horizontally uh, when these requirements are being met, which then means that people say, well, nobody would choose to walk. Lack of choice. Nobody takes the bus because we don't provide great service or nobody rides their bike because we haven't provided a safe way. All of that is mistaken for simply the demand for more auto-oriented development. And then you get other forms of transportation being un underinvested in. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars on brand new intersections and then we tell the bike lane folks uh, to compete with the public art folks, as well as the people that just want a new uh, pedestrian crossing to be installed. You guys figure out what you do with your little shred of the pie. But the main money, the big money, the contracted out money is what goes over and over again, just like a pipeline, a big coursing pipeline is pushing all of this into auto investments. And the consequence is that the system keeps growing, the system keeps expanding. And people's assumption is one more lane is gonna solve this traffic problem. One more lane is gonna shave off a few more seconds from my commute. And so then you have these mass auto-centric design uh, that leads to then the legal requirements for parking and then it carries on again. How do we continue to iterate? How do we continue? What is this path? Uh, what is a traditional development pattern that we see in other cities teach us? Another thing is to allow commercial in quote unquote residential areas, especially your neighborhood lot or your corner lots. I think of many of the new suburban subdivisions that are created. They might have a token store, but do they have a way for you to open a skate shop? Maybe it, there's a lot of skaters I'm sure in this crowd. Um, is there a way to open a nail salon? Is there a way to open whatever it might be, a small mini manufacturing thing? I always say, if it's not a slaughterhouse, go for it. Which, don't quote me on that, there was a newspaper in Medicine Hat that was said, Strongtown says you can build whatever you want. Well, no, there's, there's still constraints. We don't want unintended or uh, um, uncosted impacts on other people. But if somebody's making beef jerky in their backyard and, and it begins to grow and they do it in their garage, uh, this is the type of thing that actually allows people that first rung on the ladder, first opportunity to test a concept and continue to go from there. Uh, although in Oklahoma, your beef is so good you don't need to make it into beef jerky, right? Um, you need to allow commercial and residential areas. Again, this is sometimes what this can look like, just a front of a house converted where it's still on the second floor, you've got great residential opportunities, but on that main floor, you're providing that. And the best places are doing this. Also say, reduce discretionary reviews with as of right. 
Uh, this is maybe a little bit more of a complex illustration, but I want to show you uh, what they identified in Charleston. Uh, the structures on the left are the things that are now becoming commoditized that Chuck was talking about. Uh, it's called the Texas Donut, and it's becoming very commonplace, and so the entire block is taken up. And yet, on a performance level, the contrast with the structures on the right is quite something where you actually have more bedrooms, you actually provide uh, an equal amount of retail, you actually allow for a much higher environmental performance. Notice the land coverage, 100% land coverage compared to 62% land coverage. That means raindrops find their way to the ground. That means trees find their way up. That means people find their way onto paths rather than simply having to navigate their way through a structure like this. Uh, notice the porches creating a great street front and enabling people to do what traditionally we always did, which was spend time in our front yard, spend time with our neighbors, engage with each other. The one difference, the number of parking spaces. The number of parking spaces, and yet notice there's 145 parking spaces and 185 bedrooms. I've started saying in my city, hey, why don't we simply tell some of our projects, you can go ahead, remove some of the parking spaces, and just market them as you don't need a car to live here. Knock off $30,000 for the parking space that you didn't have to build, or if it was a detached or a parking garage, it's upwards of $60,000 to build that parking space. Say, we will take that off your purchase price, but tell you what, we're gonna ask you to commit to not driving. More and more people, particularly in desirable communities, will seek that opportunity. And who wouldn't, I mean, I love this, many people, I guess, wouldn't wanna live in what's described on the right, but a lot of people would. But this is the way in which uh, we continue to see communities emerge. Um, just briefly, I'll, I'm almost done here. Uh, one element to you is to plant street trees. Um, plant them along your sidewalks, please. I walked along the park here and I was roasting. I felt like a little bunny trying to run uh, between the spaces where I could be safe because it is hot and I'm from Vancouver, so I'm very thin skinned and weak. Um, but the consequence of it was that there is an opportunity to do things like what we describe here. And I say apologies for the metric, but, but notice, I mean, there's such a contrast in the heat that makes life on the street more pleasant or more difficult. And we talk about this uh, over and over again. This is in Tulsa, Oklahoma, two uh, nearby neighborhoods to each other. Uh, one where there was a commitment to retain trees, to cultivate them, to accept that, yes, yeah, sometimes they mess up your sewer systems or create a bit of a havoc. But a, tr a tree, particularly a street tree, is the only type of public infrastructure that increases in value as it ages. Your pipes don't do that, your roads don't do that, your sewer plants don't do that, your city hall does not do this, even this great building, the library is not going to do that, but a street tree will. And then in time it has to be taken down, but that is decades, decades, if not almost a century later, providing character, providing a refinement to a community. Another encouragement is to slow the cars. Uh, design matters, we, we talk about this frequently, uh, that there is a way to make speed safe. And we do that with highways. We have ample runoffs, uh, we have divided lanes, uh, we make sure that there is a considerable room within those lanes. And we also know how to make streets safe. Uh, very sl slow the vehicles, uh, add a bit of complexity, uh, continue to find ways to integrate the street life into what's happening on the street, have it, have it sometimes spill out where you're gonna drive slower through certain areas if you know that students might step into the street every so often outside of the school or, or things like that. Uh, you're going to instinctively slow down. If you ever have a conversation with someone that's, say you're having a riveting conversation about uh, rivets, and you're driving up and down the street, but then you turn into the parking lot. Once you do, and I have an eight-year-old son who's always yammering on in the background wonderfully, but I'll be like, Elliot, I can't focus right now. Let me focus on maneuvering through these fine little spaces in the parking lot. I need to be able to focus because my task has shifted. Now I need to maneuver through careful areas where I don't want to collide with anything. And as a consequence, I'm going to go slow. That's the principle that we need to apply to our streets. But instead, we've settled for the happy medium, which is anything but happy and very deadly. And so, Again, just a reminder uh, as I close here that the traditional development uh, truly does offer a reliable path to freedom from the trouble we've gotten ourselves into. I would encourage you as you continue to ask questions in your community uh, to, to use it as, as a bit of a litmus test to say, I wonder what strong towns would think about this. You don't have to walk away with you know, a membership and a, and a plaque and a tattoo on your right arm or anything like that. But I'd love to implant the idea that there is alternatives 
to our contemporary patterns. There's con alternatives to the ways in which we are continuing to build and establish our communities. And in time, I would say uh, the suburban experiment, which I didn't touch on as much this afternoon, but the suburban experiment has like a 40 to, or 80 year head start on me. So I figured that gives me about 40 years to try to catch up. So if you do become discouraged where you say, I don't think things are changing fast enough, part of it is to lower our assumptions or expectations and say, it'll take time. But by goodness, I think we'll get there. I think that we can press forward uh, into this. We know that we can use uh, the precious dollars that we commit to the public trust. We can use them more effectively. We can also use people's time, ingenuity, creativity, and labor more effectively than we currently do. We can use the, the graduates of the university, attract them to return by building stronger communities. We can continue to find ways uh, for our places uh, to be a place of lasting significance and lasting wealth. As, as I close it, we can reorient ourselves uh, to the way in which communities must emerge, establishing these complex feedback loops and learning always as we go. So that at the end of the day, we can spend less and get more and ha live better lives. And that is what uh, Strong Towns is all about. So thank you so much for uh, your attention this afternoon.